Next on the agenda today, we have Michael McDonnell, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Sensine Health. And in this presentation, Michael will be highlighting some of the innovative solutions they've implemented in recent years. Uh, Michael, you have got a presentation. Would you like me to applaud it or can you applaud it? Why don't, why don't you do it, Ravi? I'll, 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 I'll start talking while you do that. Otherwise, we'll have another, for another mess. And thank, thanks for the invitation, Ravi. Thanks, David, for uh, the, that introduction to the cluster. It sounds like a, a, a great initiative um, and one that's got a lot, in com uh, a, a lot in common with what we're trying to do. So I'll just give you um, an, an, an introduction to Sensine Health, um, which has recently become a partner to the Royal Wolverhampton uh, Hospital. So that's our sort of immediate connection, but very, very supportive of the idea of trying to develop um, clusters of technologies, health technologies, and um, uh, beyond London, beyond the kind of triangle between Oxford, Cambridge, and um, and, and London, although we are an Oxford-based company, we understand that the NHS is broader than that, and we certainly want to serve a, a group of people that's broader than that as well. So um, Sensine, uh, Sensine Health is, uh, was founded with the mission to achieve, a uh, mission to leverage the ethical analysis of data to develop tools that improve healthcare and predict healthcare outcomes on the one hand, and bring forward the long, uh, long promised ideal of personalized medicine on the other. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll just tell you a little bit about the company and give you a couple of case studies that bring that to life in this presentation. So Ravi, if you just go to the first slide, the next slide. At the, at the foundation, so we're, we're a young company still, two and a half, three years old. Um, we are, uh, you know, about 150 people based in Oxford, as I said, we're actually uh, um, uncommonly for a, a company like this uh, on the stock, stock exchange, the junior stock exchange in London, the AIM stock exchange, um, which was in part uh, our founder, uh, Lord Paul Drayson, a former uh, innovation and um, uh, minister in the Brown and Blair governments. Uh, he, he felt very strongly that we needed to be subjected to the rigors of uh, public transparency that public markets give you as we were uh, set up to partner with the NHS. And really at the core of our business is a collaboration with seven NHS trusts, um, a data collaboration. And, you know, it was built uh, originally out of uh, our collaboration with Oxford, but now, you know, very pleased to have well, a number of these others here. And very recently, in fact, so recently, it's not actually on the slide, the Royal Wolverhampton has become one of our partners as well. And um, that data collaboration enables us to gain access to anonymized patient records. Uh, so it's anonymized source. We never deal with um, uh, patient identif identifiable information. It's anonymized by the trust before it comes to us. Uh, but, and, and we're, not allowed, we're also not, and we're not enabled to just kind of access the data at our whim. There's obviously proportionality and other IG considerations. We have to have a specific request or clinical question we're trying to answer. But nevertheless, these trusts have granted us non-exclusive access to, to those data. So that's really important is this kind of data collaboration underpins the whole of Sensine Health. And indeed, we're moving internationally now. We've got an, an office of two people based in the United States, which is um, we didn't have, we didn't have even those two um, a couple of months ago. So we're growing growing rapidly. We expect to be um, you know uh, uh, growing internationally as well as in the UK. So next slide, please, Ravi. On the basis of that um, that data collaboration that I described with NHS trusts and soon to be other health systems, we build artificial intelligence facing into two sectors. So. First sector is uh, into uh, into into healthcare, so into actual practicing doctors and nurses and operational managers. Uh, and I'll give you a, 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 um, a little illustration of some of the work we do in a, in, a, in a moment. But I mean, in general, what we're trying to do here is build predictive algorithms that do not replace doctors or nurses, not at all. So I'm a I, I I'm, I'm much more in the camp of Eric Topol, who some of you might know from the artificial intelligence community, who says that it's not that AI will replace doctors and nurses, it's that uh, doctors and nurses using AI will replace those who do not. And I think that is right. It'll become a powerful tool to unlock 
the in data insights and analytics at a level that is impossible for humans to do, but never seek to replace uh, what humans, only humans can do, which is to care for each other and apply judgment and do all the stuff that we uh, we know our uh, clinicians do, which is not, can't be kind of summed up by what they've learned in textbooks. But we do believe that we can give them superpowers by giving them these sorts of data insights on lar very large data sets and give them tools that will improve health outcomes. So that's the one thing we do uh, with that data collaboration. The second thing we do is build artificial intelligence and other analytics for the life sciences industry. So this gets to David's um, description of how health and wealth sort of go together here. We are trying to generate a wealth and um, it's important to say it's not a, a wealth more, a more fairly shared and I'll come on to that in a minute, but we are working with um, pharmaceutical companies and I'll give you a little bit of an illustration about the work we do in a minute, but broadly to help them design better trials and improve their R&D processes um, by using data insights. So people may know that like, you know, 5%, only 5% of trials actually succeed. They're extremely expensive. Uh, they go through all these phases. And even if they do get through, many medicines are not very well uh, uh, adapted to individuals. Lots of, lots of you know, mainstream medicines just don't work on large numbers of, of people. And we don't have a good understanding of phenotypes and other factors that do mean they work. And we believe that data and the analysis of data can help improve that personalization of therapies and accelerate them they're bringing to to market so those that's kind of broadly what sunshine is it's a data collaboration on which we build clinical artificial intelligence facing into healthcare and facing into life sciences next slide please ravi so this is an illustration of some of the work we do in healthcare uh very recent uh we built obviously um with the pandemic upon us we felt uh, we, we need to work with our partners to develop um tools to help manage that crisis. And this was developed specifically with um, Chelsea Westminster Hospital, one of our, uh, our partners in West London, uh, but it is now regulated for UK use. And we are um, we have partnered with Sheffield and a few other trusts uh, to expand its use. And we'll be uh, we are talking with um, the Royal Wolverhampton as well. What it is, is a, um, a personalized risk assessment of COVID patients and their likelihood of ending up in ICU, ending up in mechanical, in ventil mechanical ventilation, or uh, unfortunately ending up dead. And uh, it performs lots better than, you know, granted there are not a standardized uh, tools yet in place for COVID management, but it performs lots better than NEWS2, which is a standardized tool for managing the de deterioration of patients in a generalized way. And it does so by showing exactly how it's developing predictions about individual patients, you know, and you can see these, some of these things It explains the, the, what is driving these predictions. So it is not intending to make a hard and fast decision for anybody or to diagnose. What it is intending to do is help a tired doctor, uh, maybe a junior doctor to double check or have one more look at a patient and who they may think is safe and the algorithm suggests is not. Ultimately, it's the decision of the clinician, but we believe these artificial intelligence tools using large data sets can help, make, make, help them make the better, better decisions. And so this is, as, as I say, something which is now able to be rolled out across the NHS and we're working with the NHS to do so and to adapt it to changing treatment practices. So that's an example of what we do in healthcare. Next slide, Ravi. The next slide will be a, um, this is, um, and you might, you won't be able to read this, sorry about the small font, um, but I'll, I'll just talk to it. This is describes a little bit of what we do in the life sciences. And by having access to what they call real world data, uh, real world evidence that is, you know, anonymized patient record data at an aggregate level, we never give our data to our pharma clients. What we do is analyze it on their behalf. Um, and this is this is an example of what we call deep clustering, which is in effect using supervised and unsupervised machine learning approaches to understand patient segments at a level of detail that it uh, have not previously been able to do. So, if you want to understand, for instance, who's going to uh, suffer from heart failure, what type of heart failure, under what conditions, with what trajectory, you can uh, delve into this data and really pull apart patient cohorts, and if 
some of you on this call have got some experience of working in pharma, you'll know that kind of the, uh, the inclusion exclusion criteria for tr clinical trials are incredibly important. Understanding exactly what types of patients will benefit, incredibly important. And so this is what uh, these sorts of analyses do. Um, we have a number of other kind of techniques. We also apply for our life sciences partners, including things like synthetic control arms. So you can imagine that even in time of COVID, but also previously, it's very hard to stand up clinical trials with a kind of active arm and then a placebo arm uh, when people don't really want to be in the uh, in the placebo arm. Well, sometimes we can, under certain conditions, you can uh, alleviate the numbers that you need to put in the placebo arm by using constructing, in effect, a di digital co cohort to test against your active arm. And that can be very important in, you know, um, certain therapies towards the end of life where people really don't want to be on that. It's un unethical. It can also be important in sort of different trial designs with three arms and so forth. So there's a number of techniques that uh, real world analysis of data can help our pharmaceutical clients help, uh, you know, speed, speed their therapies and, um, and, and ensure they're more effective and that we match the right therapies, the right to the right people, which is the kind of underlying promise of personalized medicine. Next slide, please, Ravi. Just to wind up then, I wanted to explain our, this is the reason why I joined Sensine Health from uh, Google DeepMind uh, now about seven months ago. Uh, we are really serious about giving back uh, and sharing the value of um, our access to NHS data um, in an anonymized form, as I say, so much so that we actually, uh, the 13% the of Sunshine is now owned by the NHS uh, and they get the benefits of our growth. Um, and we expect that to go up to sort of a fifth of the company. It's, although it's a public company, we grant um, equity to each new partner that comes along so they can share in our, in our growth. Um, and that helps them, you know, balance their own books and so, and so forth. We also invest, um, 1.25 million at least in uh, digital in, the, in our partners' infrastructure as part of our um, partnership with them, and when we do um, deals with pharma to help them, um, you know, make more money from their drugs and make them more successful, we share the revenue from that with them too. There are we have a sliding scale depending on the contract value, but we'll share the the revenue with our NHS partners. So we're we're clear that although we believe we add value. There is value in, in anonymized data, patient data, and we want to help the NHS leverage that, and they deserve a share in it. Uh, and ultimately, we believe the patients themselves do too. There are lots of there's lots of work to do to work out how we do that, and uh, you know, and, and really, that's just something we have to partner with the government to do. But I believe the data economy of the future is one where we share value um, amongst us, and it is not does not solely accrue to large firms. And then to say it's not just all financial benefits for our NHS partners, we also obviously provide these tools free of charge um, and we're looking to export them. Um, but we, you know, we're building to help the NHS. We think of the NHS as our R&D partner and our, the global markets as our, as our sort of wealth partner. So that's Sensine Health. Um, uh, as I say, we've been delighted to be working with Royal Wolverhampton, an absolutely outstanding trust that's got a long reputation, I know, back from my days working in the NHS for innovation, and has got some special kind of connections with its primary care community and its citizens that enable us, I think, to do uh, new things. And we're super excited about partnering with West Midlands economy more generally and with Royal Wolverhampton specifically. So that, that, that's Sensine, and I'm happy to answer questions whenever, whenever you guys are ready. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Michael. So we've got a, a panel session coming up shortly. And so I think we've got a few questions that we can ask then. So moving on next to the agenda, we have Peninda Dadwa, who's ex-COO of the leading London digital agency DARE. He joined a Mobisoft leadership team as a managing partner to help underpin the next phase of business growth and development. And he brings with him 25 years of experience. And today he'll be providing examples of digital health innovations that Mobisoft have recently been involved in. Over to you, Peninda. Right, um, thank you uh, uh, for the welcome and uh, uh, good morning to the panel. Um, uh, Michael, David, those are both uh, really great presentations to, uh, and, and really, really interesting. Um, and definitely have some questions for, for both of you guys a little bit later. Um, 
So a little bit about Imobisoft. Um, so Imobisoft's been going for about 10 years. Um, it's a bespoke software development business. Um, uh, and within Imobisoft, we have an arm called Innovate Health. Um, and Innovate Health is a very much specialized health tech business. Um, uh, we work across a number of trusts. Um, we work within pharma for companies like GSK. Uh, and predominantly, we build um, bespoke health platforms um, uh, to, to meet requirements specifically within, within trusts. Um, so uh, today, I'll just walk you through through um, a couple of um, uh, sort of examples of, of applications that we've produced. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any slides, I'm very sorry. Um, so you just have to listen to me drone for a little bit. Um, so I, I, won't, um, uh, I won't make them too long-winded either. Um, so uh, we've like I said, been doing this for about 10 years in, in terms of the business. Um, and there's been a lot of learnings over that period of time. Um, and I think that for anybody who's worked within uh, a trying to deliver health tech, especially within the NHS, um, you'll realize that there are, there are a number of barriers that come up um, and, and our experience has really been about um, how do you navigate the system um, and how do you help innovation that exists within the NHS to come to life? Because most of the stuff that we work with um, is actually clinician driven. Uh, so more than likely, it's something that a clinician has come to us and said, look, you know, we've got this idea, we think it'd be great if we could have an application that did this for us or, or a tool that could help us to do this. Um, uh, and trying to bring that innovation to life is quite complex in the NHS. Um, it's not always straightforward. There's um, obviously all of the requirements around medical grade equipment, et cetera, and all of the requirements uh, around um, uh, both feasibility studies, et cetera, to make sure that we've, we've met all the right criteria and then all the assessments that are required. And as we're all aware also, that's an ever moving um, thing in the NHS because there's new requirements coming up. Uh, DTAC was just launched um, only a couple of weeks back by NHS as, as the new assessment criteria for, criteria for digital tools. Um, so um, a little bit about some of the work that we've done. So uh, we've developed a, uh, a system uh, with the University Hospital of North Midlands, um, or specifically around COPD, so chronic obstructive of pulmonary disease. Um, uh, and it's basically, in, in a nutshell, it helps patients to better manage uh, their own condition. Um, and uh, being a chronic condition, so it doesn't have a long-term cure, so it's something that most patients have to be able to adjust uh, and learn to live with. Um, but in the normal treatment path, um, you would go in for assessments, um, uh, and effectively these would either be on sort of a normal care path, would be a three-month or a two-month assessment, depending on how, how bad your condition is. Um, but we've built a tool which is on one side of a front-facing app, um, so effectively has a daily health questionnaire. Um, it links to a Bluetooth uh, spirometer, which also connects directly to the app, so allows them to take lung capacity readings on a regular basis. Um, uh, and then there's a clinician dashboard, which the clinician can see, and it provides alerts to them regarding their patient cohort um, and within all that there's an algorithm that helps to predict um, exacerbations so currently it's proven to already be over 95 percent successful in the prediction of exacerbations and the key to this is that obviously exacerbations normally lead to hospitalization and so from both aspects whether it's from the NHS's point of view of reducing the hospitalizations and obviously from a very much patient point of view of not wanting to end up in hospital um, that's the core benefit that we have here um, is that it reduces hospitalization and frees up clinician time so the old pathway where effectively you would go in to see your clinician on a regular basis irrespective of where there was any underlying change in your symptoms isn't really a requirement anymore because the clinician can already see uh, your data dashboard he understands uh, how your symptoms have been moving um, and the other thing is it allows interventions at an earlier stage so effectively where a clinician does see deterioration even if they don't see the exacerbation being predicted they can already say well actually you know either he needs to come in for an early consultation uh, maybe there's a change in medication requirement or even if it's just go and see a GP because we're, we're concerned about where your condition is going. So, so those earlier interventions all help um, the patient to self-manage um, their condition uh, and effectively we also know that self-management not only helps in the physical treatment of the condition but from a mental well-being perspective most patients feel much more positive knowing that condition they can manage as opposed to feeling that they effectively are being managed by the system um, and that's one of the, the, the key things are around our learnings of actually where we produce applications which are to treat a particular condition there are other benefits that will come out of that um, that are not necessarily the primary benefits that, that we're trying to achieve um, 
And so that is a currently now that's been a that's a spin off out of University uh, uh, North, Hospital of North Midlands, um, and is currently now in clinical trial stage as well. So, uh, and we've also applied for FDA approval. So hopefully that that will have quite a broad impact uh, once once we've gone been through the clinical trials and the approval processes. Um, on the other side, we're currently working with Birmingham Children's Hospital um, uh, for a condition known PKU, so phenylketonuria. Um, so <clears throat> effectively, that's a, a metabolic disorder um, which prevents the normal breakdown of proteins. Um, in, in the UK, it's normally picked up pretty much at birth. Um, uh, but effectively, what it means is that the, it is a, a management of diet from a very, very young age uh, because the, the impact of, absorb, of not being able to absorb and break down the protein proteins can have significant uh, neurological impacts uh, for, for young children. Um, and so we're building an application there with, with that team, uh, which is really about helping families as much as so it's not the patient is normally uh, very much at the young end, but it's helping families to manage that process um, and be able to help them to identify which foods are safe, which foods are not. Uh, we've created a bespoke calculation model, which effectively allows them to enter the data from a food label and it then converts it for them to tell them uh, how much of that food they can have within a particular day, within a time period. Um, and that is also now um, at trial stage. So currently they're, they're recruited for that trial, obviously been a bit held back with um, uh, COVID-19, et cetera. Uh, but we're hoping that that trial uh, will be, the cohort should be complete hopefully by the end of this month. Uh, we should have results back in about six months. Uh, so, so once again, uh, being able to prove that the digital intervention provides a better solution to the current existing care, care path, which is based around uh, paper-based diary systems um, and effectively allowing that, that data to be collated in one place will allow um, both the, the clinicians to have a longer term view as well of the behaviours of the cohort um, beyond just saying, well, actually, this is the best advice. Um, so there's that, uh, a project that we delivered a little while ago, also with Birmingham Children's Hospital and in conjunction with the Lullaby Trust. Um, it's called Baby Check App, um, uh, and that was delivered after a five-year clinical study um, uh, in a cohort of about 1,000 young babies. And that's really the principle of that app was around... Um, uh, young parents, especially first-time parents, um, uh, and, and, you know, I've, I've been there a long, long time ago now, but it seems like it is. A, um, but that that fear factor when you have your when you know when you have very young infant of understanding when your child is ill, but normally ill, you know, things like teething, etc., all those kind of things, which is it's the young parent. It's, it's still quite you know traumatic when you're going through it, versus actually seriously ill, as in then there is a requirement for medical intervention. Um, uh, and that has, you know, there apps, it's actually on the App Store, it's had over 10,000 downloads. Um, and effectively what it does is it works through a 19 uh, point checklist uh, to help uh, any parent to assess the, the actual severity of the symptoms that they're seeing. Um, and so it can lead, it can lead to anything to actually, you know what your, your babe, what your baby's going through is absolutely normal to actually, do you know what, you need to go and ring 111 or actually you need to go and attend A&E now. Um, and so those are, are, are like you know it's one of those apps that's out there which effectively we know has a, has a real impact um because we get to read the reviews etc that people post up, up on up on the on the app stores so so um so that's kind of a, a very quick kind of overview of the kind of work that we do and we also work with some pharma clients we were with gsk uh, on development of some of their internal systems as well um so really i suppose where we come from is very much producing um technology which is innovation driven from a clinical perspective uh, so we, we're not trying to build overarching systems although we do have a, a remote clinic system which we're working on at the moment um, but really it's much more about where clinicians say actually this is broken in the system um, I don't understand why we can't make this work better um, and actually providing those fixes um, in that system so, so so that's that's really the ethos of, of what, we're, what we're trying to do uh, which is really we try and work more quickly and more nimbly as well. So that's um, a little bit about Innovate Health. Fantastic, Paninda. That's really great to hear. So I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Paddy Murphy, who's going to manage the panel discussion. Over to you, Paddy. Not very many of us to manage, but there you go. I have to say, I never cease to be amazed at the things that I learn when I come to these events. Um, you know, as I put in, in the chat, it, I never really thought of Wolverhampton and Staffordshire as the place where is the real hotbed of innovation because we talk about Birmingham in relation to digital so much but actually the things that are going on there are absolutely incredible 
Um, and I, um, questions that come up in the chat, the big one, I think, and it's, you know, digital, it was biotechnology 15 years ago, it's digital now, the panacea for all ills. How is it that, how do we make this, you know, routine across a system? Because you must have challenges with sharing data. David asked the question about, you know, what are the barriers to, to data sharing? How do we make this a reality? Answers on a postcard, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll, have a, I'll have a go at this. I mean, you're absolutely right. The premise, I think, is uh, the NHS in general is, you know, it's got lots of pockets of innovation, but very poor at then evaluating them and spreading them in a kind of systematic mm -hmm. way. So that is that is very much a... Um, so there's some basics, I think, that need to be... Um, that need to be uh, done, like we do need to evaluate them and make sure we've got a decent evidence base and so forth. There's a lot of, as you said, there's a lot of people out there saying, I've got a, I've got a tool that'll solve all ills. Well, we've got to figure mm -hmm. out what, which ones actually do and be rigorous about that. I think we need the government and, uh, you know, to do, uh, to do a few things better, like set priorities a little bit cl more clearly. What, what therapeutic areas, what problems need to be solved so that they don't have only a, a supply-led sort of uh, approach yeah. to this, where it's like, it should be a bit more demand-led. It should be a little bit like, you know, this is what we think we need. We'll help you do it. We'll help you navigate. We may fund it. We need a little bit more direction like that. And we certainly need some more um, attention to some of the basics in sort of digital infrastructure. You know, there's still, I was speaking to a hospital CEO just, just last week who still got an entirely paper-based Hospital. That's just. Yeah. This shouldn't be doing. We shouldn't. This, that's not. Up, the NHS is much greater than it should be. Greater than that. It needs to be more ambitious than that. So there's some thoughts, anyways. Yeah. Wow. Any thoughts think, for a minute? Yeah, I mean, it, I think that around. Um, and I know, Michael, you've had a lot of experience in the data sharing aspect of it as well. Is that um, we forget we we speak about the NHS as as a body, as a, and we forget that actually thing, the reality yeah. is it's not. Um, and I don't, you know, uh, you know, I don't have an overarching opinion on on the current sort of reorganisation once again, um, uh, and 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 the new formats that are being introduced. But realistically, um, that inability to be able to have a single viewpoint of what the priorities are. Um, on the one side, you'd, so you'd argue actually that's correct because actually regionally there are different health priorities, you know, so, you know, if, if heart disease is something that's significant in one area, it might not necessarily be significant in another area. Mm. Um, uh, so from one aspect, you can understand that, but overarchingly, it does mean that therefore investment and, and even the ideas that need to be thought about are very um, uh, sort of random pockets. Um, and, you know, and that's why when we work with clinicians, we're quite upfront about you know sometimes they'll say oh, we've got this great idea and if we roll it out across the nhs it'll be excellent and yeah. we're very clear with them that what you have is you have a problem in your hospital that you've identified and the truth is that might be the entire market for what you want us to build and we'll go out and do a feasibility study and go and speak to our you know so obviously we, we work with multiple trusts and we understand um, and we might ask you know, is this similar etc and even when we come back to the clinician so it's great and we said okay we've identified that it exists in a few other hospitals but once again just so we're really clear it might only ever work here and the rest of the trust might never buy into it um irrespective of how good it is and how great the tool is um and i think that is one of the things and that's why sometimes we'll get clinicians who really excited about stuff and then when we explain to them look you know what just so we're really giving you a reality check at the start of this journey um they'll be like oh actually I don't, i'm not really in that keen in it anymore um but better to to know that that's where the system is now rather than trying to think that you're going to change to change the world but i think that you know uh, and that's why we kind of focus on the little things that we think actually, you know what, in this hospital, in this ward, we've built something which will effectively at least change this part. And then if we can make it scale, great. If we can't, it's not the end of the world. But, and, you know, and I think maybe what we lack is, you know, the, the scale, maybe like Michael of, of a business of yours, where actually, you know, well, maybe that that's where we need to work and partner better with other businesses mm -hmm. because we can build products and, and technology and prove the concept and understand it. But we don't, definitely don't have the scale to go and approach all of the trusts and, and, and go in and speak to all of them just from physical man, man out point of view. Um, so maybe we do need to, to, to look more with other businesses and understand where our strengths and weaknesses are. And I can't help but feel that this is where the cluster may be able to add some value. What do you think, David? Because it strikes me that it, it will have this view across the piece and it, 
because I think the fact that this uh, this stuff is going to go um, onto a onto a YouTube channel is going to be available for other people to see. I think that the stories that are told here, maybe it's our chance to get some traction, do something at scale across West Midlands or Midlands or wherever um, to be that yeah, independent I think, broker. Um, I think at the scale that we are, the West Midlands, um, we can be a good educator and we can be a good agitator. And mm. uh, what Michael said about um, national government setting priorities and paying attention to the digital infrastructure, we can do some of that at the at the regional level. Admittedly, mm. it's not it's not national, um, but we can also be an advocate to government that they need to pay attention to these things as well. So yeah, there are things that we can contribute to the vision that these two ent entrepreneurs have got. I'm conscious the time is is not on our side. David, you asked an interesting question about what skills implications of the use of these type of technologies are going to be. How are we going to have to change our, our skill sets within the NHS and, and health services more generally? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, what, one thing is I'd say that um, these skills are sort of developing anyways. I mean, it's uh, there is, a, you know, the, I think digital capabilities and comforts with digital tools is a thing which has you know, been growing just as it is in the rest of society. So we mustn't sort of exaggerate the problem, but specifically in kind of in artificial intelligence where, you know, where I work, it is very important that we, work, you know, we bring up this, the capabilities of um, clinicians in particular to interpret some of this yeah. work because as I said about the explainability, these are not perfect tools, uh, they are, uh, you know, they, they they can be a black box. They need to you need to be able to question them. You need to understand what you're being told, and you must realize that there could be biases in it, racial and otherwise. And mm. those require a critical mind. And one of the biggest risks in this is um, creating a kind of implicit mindset that you can just rely on the machine to tell you the right answer. That is not going to work in in the near. You know, maybe never. Uh, we're not building tools like that. We're building tools that have to be engaged with another critical mind. And so yeah. how to do that in a behavioral way is really important, I think. And it would be, you know, it would be a disaster for us if we thought that we weren't humble enough to realize that, the, the, that there are biases and other problems with these tools and therefore, you know, you need to be, need to be questioned. And I think countering that perception that we might be creating another howl here is, you know, tackle it head on. Because as you say, these are only tools in the hands of experts. Yeah. Um, I noticed we've got a couple of other people on the call, Josh or John or Devon. Do you have any questions you'd like to, to throw in? You're all on mute at the moment. <laughs> well, whilst we wait, I've got a quick question I can ask, which is opportunities for serious games for health, digital pedometers, cal calorie counting apps, and they can have major impacts on health. I've not seen anything done regionally around that, but you know, as we look at the, the opportunity that digital presents, it also presents the opportunity for patients to take ownership of their health as well. And I, I see that as an opportunity. What do you panelists think? Yeah, I mean, um, if you don't mind on that, on that, 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 that the front alone, patient-led diagnostics, um, especially where it's in consumer facing tools already so you know we talk about things like on your apple watch or your, your samsung watch mm -hmm. or any of the other smart watches that are out there um you know everything now up to blood oxygen level monitoring um uh my my only fear with that um is that uh, you know my kind of touched on it that we're creating really powerful models that even clinicians need to be taught how to to understand if you then give a plethora of health data but without the logic of how it's interpreted, um, you know, would, would I understand what a good blood oxygen reading is or, or not? It's probably not. And, and yet, if you give me a tool that does it, I'll look at it anyway. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think that there, there is an element of, um, it's great that the tools are out there and we will find uses for them. Um, but um, my, my fear is also that actually, if you throw everything to everybody, does it actually really help anybody at all? And then the other point, the last one I'll make on that is, not all of the tools that are consumer facing are medical device graded. Um, 
And that yeah. is not very often clearly communicated, definitely not in an ad, in the ad for the Apple Watch. Um, you know, it might appear as a very, very much small print somewhere versus, you know, the diagnostic tools that, that will give you the, the, the right clinical level of measurement. Um, and I think those are the two levels of danger that I always say to people, you know, we just got to be careful about that. There's definitely real positives, but, you know, the, we're still not quite there yet. Okay. I see John has joined us from the International Space Station. Um, <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, it looks better than my home office uh, uh, background. So uh, um, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, folks. Um, I'm, I'm new to the group. I'm, I'm new to, in a sense, uh, working in the Midlands. So uh, I just thought of, I'm just finding what the landscape is like in terms of the East and West Midlands. I've started a new post at Coventry University in a new centre uh, for intelligent healthcare, it's called. Uh, we're interested in devices and uh, that, that sort of thing, sensing particularly, and then novel uh, physiological measurements. And so it's a new centre being set up, and uh, but it's, it's quite challenging, obviously, doing it remotely uh, from Whitley Bay in New near Newcastle. That's where I live. So I've uh, been here. Uh, been in the job Not a bad place to be operating from, there. frankly. Sorry? Not a bad place to be operating from. <laughs> no, no, that's right. But it's not quite the, the International Space Station. But, uh, <laughs> Um, but my background before this is about 30 years in medical physics, actually working in a hospital in diagnostics, um, okay. uh, medical devices. So I'm seeing it from the academic point of view now and the more commercial side uh, of device development. So it's interesting well, anyway, it seems to marry with what a lot of you, you're saying. I understand everything that's been said. So thank you. It's just interesting. So no other comments than that, just to say hello, really. Super. Well, really, really pleased that you, you've joined us today and hopefully you'll keep coming along because we'll have a, a whole programme of roadshows with uh, lots of, of on lots of different topics. So there should be something for everyone in there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I'm conscious we've got two minutes to go. Uh, Devon, do you have anything you'd like to add? Poor old Josh, I think, has had has Internet problems. So uh, I don't think he's going to be adding anything to the conversation. Right. As you asked that question, my Internet glitched as well. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to add for me today. I was just along to listen and absorb. Uh, and just thank you so much for all of the, the content and the presentations and just the, the expertise that you've all shared today. It's been um, a bit mind blowing, but in a really good way. Mind stretching, I should say, not mind blowing. Well, I think it's mind blowing, frankly. So yeah. with that, I think <laughs> it's, unless anybody's got anything else to add, I think it's time to wrap up. It's just before 11 o'clock. Just to say that this is going to, you know, the roadshows will continue. And as I've been going along, I've been sort of writing down all the interesting things we'd like to talk about, like how do you regulate AI? Big questions, things for the cluster to look at in the future, perhaps. So we're going to have this rolling programme of roadshows. I hope that you'll sort of join the list, come along and, and listen. I think the one thing I've learned coming along to these is I learn something new every single time I come along. So thank you very much, everybody, for your, yeah. for your time Thanks. today. David, have you got any closing remarks? I just want to say a big thank you to Michael and to Paninda. It's As you said, Paddy, the, the region is fizzing with ideas and innovation, and it's just a matter of harnessing it for the benefit of everybody who lives in the region.